Hey everybody, Brayden here and welcome to a new video. Today I thought I'd do something new and that is covering a opening in chess. And today we're going to be looking at the Roy Lopez opening and more specifically the Chagorin defense. But how do we reach the Chagorin defense in the first place? We need to actually get to that point and talk about how we get there and why we get there um, before we just talk about what the opening is and what to do. So the opening arises, uh, the Rui Lopez specifically, after this classical setup of moves of e4, e5, knight f3, and knight to c6. And there are a few options here. There's the scotch, the Italian, but what we're covering today is of course the Rui Lopez, which is bishop b5. The point of this move is to pressure the knight, which has an indirect influence on the center. For example, if we were able to right now, we would love to be able to take on c6 and win the e5 pawn, though there is a trick in the position. Um, so for example, a6 is the move we'll be looking at. Why isn't bishop take c6 the correct move? Now this is technically an okay move. This is called the exchange Ray Lopez. It's not what we're covering today, um, but it does give up the bishop pair. And um, after d take c6, it actually does not lose a pawn for black, which is very important to note. Because after knight takes e5, there's actually a move in this position in which black can play. And that is the move queen to d4. This attacks e4 and e5 at the same time, wins the pawn back, and black is actually preferred because of the bishop pair. Um, but let's move back. So we, we just covered a lot, and I think we should slow down a bit. Uh, there are several responses for black in this position as well. Uh, the big two, obviously, are a6 and knight to f6. There's other sidelines like knight to d4. I don't think they should be taken as seriously. Um, knight to f6 will be the Berlin. And if we can hit 1,000 subscribers on this channel, I'll be doing a 10-hour coverage of the Berlin endgame. Uh, and, of course, I'll show you how to get to that right now just for fun. Castles, knight takes e4, d4, knight d6, takes, 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 knight f5, queen takes d8. If you want to know why we do this and what all this endgame is about, again, it'll be 10 hours. You'll find that out if we can hit 1,000 subscribers. I'll cover that for 10 hours. It's one of the most boring games. Boring, quote unquote. Um, I think it's quite interesting still, but it's considered one of the most boring uh, openings at the top level. Anyways, let's get back to it. So a6 is played. And this is to ask the bishop where it's going. So usually bishop to a4 will be played, and that is what will be recommended by me here. And this is how we reach the Chagorn defense. And then knight to f6. Now, instead of defending the e4 pawn, white can castle. And black can take on e4. Uh, there are two responses, which is rook to e1 and d4, uh, both of which lead to very interesting games. Uh, however, we will not be covering the open Spanish in this game. Instead, we will be looking at the move bishop to e7, which goes along with the Chagorin defense. There's also other moves too. Bishop c5 is also quite good, um, bringing it to a more active square. Uh, but bishop to e7 was for a long time considered uh, one of the more popular moves. And I think the reason why goes back to why bishop c5 isn't maybe as good. And that's because of the moves c3 and d4 in the future, where d4 will be attacking the bishop with tempo uh, and will force it to move uh, to a less active square. So the bishop just stays on a less active square and avoids the tempo of d4. Let's move on. So bishop to e7... And now rook to e1. And now we do have the threat of bishop takes c6. This is very important. So for example, if black were to castle in this position, this would be a grave mistake. Because bishop takes c6, d takes c6, and knight takes e5. And as you can see, there is queen d4, and they are attacking this pawn twice and our knight once. But after knight to f3, their queen is being attacked, and they do not have time to win e4. And we can always consolidate with the move d3 and white is just up a clean pawn. That's why after rook to e1, black tends to play the move b5. Now this does not al allow white to capture on c6, so the bishop will generally move away. Uh, d6 is a very common response. You might also see castling, and if you play c3 here, this leads to the martial gambit. Uh, that's something we can cover at another time. Um, but today we're going to be looking at the classical response of d6. 
which just adds extra protection to the e5 pawn and also prepares of course moves like castling as well as bishop to uh, even b7 or bishop to along this diagonal e6 or uh, to g4 and what you'll generally see here is white plays the move c3 now this is actually a multi-purpose move and we should discuss why it's such a good move here uh, and why other moves might not be as good there's two reasons first off this does allow the break d4 which gives white more space in the center. But that's not the only reason. Uh, in fact, it also defends against the threat of knight to a5. For example, if we were to play h3 to prevent bishop g4, which feels like a very natural response, the move knight to a5 feels somewhat annoying. And the reason why is because now this bishop cannot escape. It might look silly playing c3, where after knight to a5, for example, of course, what should be played first is castles h3 and then knight to a5. It doesn't really matter, so we'll look at this in the main move order of castles. h3, which prevents bishop g4, and now knight a5. Now we have this move bishop c2. And the way to think about it is, in the Roy Lopez, the light squared bishop is like your star piece. Uh, as we can see, even though this e4 pawn's in the way for now, and this looks like a very strange move, if we can imagine this e4 pawn being removed or being pushed forward, uh, the bishop's on a very, very good diagonal, and there's a lot of po attacking potential for white in these types of positions. Uh, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. Whereas this knight is a bit offsides, and uh, we're not really sure what it's doing. Now, we would also call this kind of like a, a fluid position, and, well, that's because of the pawn structure, but we're kind of looking at a lot of pieces so i think it would be easier if we go through the next few moves and then talk about the pawn structure after so let's do that so after bishop to c2 what we'll see is c5 and usually d4 and uh queen c7 is the uh, main response here there's also i believe taking is okay too first but queen c7 is by far the most popular move and this is kind of where the theory ends and where I want to end uh, leading up to this position and all of those little minute details uh, that we've seen up to this point. Now, let's take a look at the pawn structure, and then I would like to take a look at one of the games I've played in this position before to get an understanding of how the game should progress. Because even though we got to this position, it doesn't mean we know how to play it, right? So we need to look at another game to see what the common plans are and what the recurring ideas should be when you play in the Roy Lopez. So let's do that. All right, now we're looking at the same position, but we're looking at, well, the pawn structure. And this structure has the pawn already on d5, which is something I recommend to do as early as possible, just because you get that grip. But when you get a position like this, which is very, very common in the Roy Lopez, what does one do exactly? This is, again, this is the most classical pawn structure, and I think this is the most important one to look at when you're playing the Roy Lopez. Um, but there's a lot of plans, and there's a lot of things that can be done. So the two things you want to do in a position, actually there's more than just two, there's, there's millions of things you can look at. Um, but when you're looking at a new opening and you're deciding what to do, I would say one of the first things you should look at, at least for plans, is... What are the pawn breaks? Pawn breaks are good to look for because it lets your pieces uh, open the position. And if you can open a position up where you're favorable, then you can increase a space edge or you can increase an, initi an initiative on that side. Um, so, for example, the move f4 is quite a strong move, as we can see. Uh, because, well, if we imagine a rook staying on f1, or going back to f1 in the future, that's a bit of a hint for a game we'll see, um, we can see that a lot of pieces would be aimed towards that side of the board, which is the king side, uh, namely a bishop on c1, that bishop on c2 we talked about, because now after f4, if takes, then there's always these e5 ideas. Um, there's a knight either on f3, and sometimes this knight goes to g3, um, and yeah, all the pieces can kind of join in the attack quite quickly, and there can be a lot of trouble. Not only that, but because white is better in the center, sometimes they're better on both sides of the board and you can choose where you wanna play. So F4 is quite good, but it is a little risky, right? You're opening up your king a little bit. So there's also the break A4, 
which can be useful. And there's actually a game that is very important to know, which is a Karpov Unsucker game. You will find that in the description in case you were interested, uh, in which the A file was taken over, then the king side was taken over with this F4 break, and uh, well, uh, Karpov's opponent just kind of just got dominated and lost quite slowly uh and that's kind of the nature of the ray lopez it's a bit of a slow death for black if they aren't active and if they're not careful enough the next plan is also where the pieces belong and we've kind of discussed this already so normally the pieces belong where you're trying to make your plans work so if you're going for a file domination you usually will want your rooks on the a file however if you're going for a king side attack and sometimes you can do both at the same time because of your massive space advantage in this opening uh, you go for the f4 break, but generally you'll have a knight either on f3 or and g3. You'll have your bishop still stay on uh, c1 for uh, quite a while, a bishop on c2, your queen on d1, and usually you'll bring your rook back like to e1 because you bring the knight from f1 to g3, as we'll see in the game. Uh, and then usually it goes back to this f1 square and you go for this f4 break. But, of course, we can talk about all of these different ideas and kind of talk about where the pieces kind of belong, but we also need to see an example, and um, I think it's time that we do that. Alrighty, so here is the game. I was playing with the white pieces. This was an online game and an online tournament, and I played e4, and I get to the Roy Lopez, and we see us get to the Chagorn defense, defense which is this knight a5 move. Um, however, they do play a slightly different move order. Instead of castling in this position, they play knight a5 first, and then castle. It doesn't quite matter because after h3, it just transposes. Um, so transposition just essentially means that uh, after d6 and c3, uh, if castles h3, knight a5, and bishop c2, it's the exact same position, just a different move order. In case you didn't know uh, the word transposition, which is used quite a bit in, uh, in chess here. So uh, knight to a5, now bishop c2, castles, and h3, as mentioned before. And this is the uh, Chagorin defense. We see c5 and d4. Now after queen c7, uh, which is the most co common move, I actually recommend a different move than what others might play. So most people would play knight bd2 here. This has been the most common move for a very long time. However, I prefer the move d5. And the big reason is because it just gains so much space in the center and doesn't allow black to open things up and potentially save their position a bit. Uh, when you play a move like d5, you're preparing for a very, very long game. And that's kind of what happened here. So let's continue. So they played bishop to d7. I played knight bd2. And as we discussed, right, uh, this rook often moves to e1, usually to defend e4, but also to give room for this knight, which will head to g3 and it heads to g3 via f1. So uh, they played c4, and part of the reason why they wanted to is because they might land a knight on c5 here, trying to go for a ton of activity and make counterplay against the e4 pawn. Another way they can do it, again, we shouldn't always just look at white's plans, we need to know what black's trying to do in the position too. Um, the knight can go to c5, and we might even see some sort of uh, g6, rook e8, Fianchetto the bishop and go for a potential f5, uh, actually, that it, this is quite common as well in these positions. So knight to f1. Now they play rook f to c8 uh, instead of rook to e8. And this is partly due, I believe, because they wanted to be able to play bishop to e8 to defend uh, their f7 pawn. Or uh, they also just want to potentially try to open up the c file and the rook would be better placed here. I played knight g3, and now we can see that white kind of got the ideal setup, right? The rook's on e1, uh, the knights are both on f3 and g3, and we'll find out why this is important very shortly. Uh, the bishop on c1, even though it hasn't moved from its beginning square, it's quite strong, isn't it? Look at this. It's looking at a ton of uh, squares on the king side for black, and it can be a real menace, as we'll see in this game. So my opponent played bishop to f8. I played bishop to g5, as now, of course, this piece can be attacked. Um, and the problem is, they would love to fianchetto, but they're just one move too short. And if they, for example, played a move like queen to d8, maybe I can consider a move like knight to h5, add a little bit more pressure, or just leave the position as is, because they put themselves in a pin. 
Um, but they played knight to e8 instead. And now it's time for the plan I discussed before. Even though the move rookie one was very useful by getting the knight to g3, as discussed before, it's kind of done its purpose on e1. And it's looking at nothing. Now it's time to go for some more active play. And that's where the move rook to f1 comes into play, where now we're looking to move this knight off of f3 and play for the f4 break. As we can see, black on this side of the board, if we cut the board in half, black has two pieces on this side of the board. However, white has four pieces, if you do not include the kings as uh, pieces here. And the white queen can quickly run over. And of course, again, if this e5 move happens, this bishop also gets into play. So there are a lot of pieces potentially facing against this black king. And that's kind of important when you're looking for attacks in chess. You need to look at how many pieces are on which side of the board and uh, see where your pieces are best coordinated. So knight to b7 was played. This is in part due to uh, going to c5 potentially. And now I play knight to h2. And knight to h2 is very, very obvious with its intentions. I'm just going for f4 here. My opponent played f6. I had to move my bishop, of course. And then they played g6, uh, trying to go for this fianchetto. Um, but their position feels a little bit odd already. And this is why I go for the move f4. And I'm trying to open things up on this side of the board again, because as we saw before, there's not too many pieces on the king side for black, and if we can open things up and create an initiative, it might be harder for them to defend. Bishop to g7, and now a pretty surprising move, but this is the correct move to play. The move f5. Why is this correct though? Uh, this is correct because I'm trying to weaken the light squares. This might look stupid because it makes the bishop on c2 worse. However, there is a concrete idea behind it where after g5, there's the move queen to h5. And now we're bringing this knight to g4. We can play for an h4 break, and all of the pieces kind of join the attack very quickly, whereas there's not a lot of space for these pieces to join the defense, which is very important. So queen to d8, trying to remaneuver to join the defense. h4, h6. Knight to g4, and now I can win this pawn uh, almost whenever I want. For example, if king h7, I can just give a check and then win this pawn. However, I decided to play it a bit more slowly, so they play queen e7, and I don't really care too much about the pawn in this position. Uh, I play queen to g6, which I think is actually a quite interesting move. Uh, as you can see, again, not much has changed uh, for black in these positions. They had now have three pieces on the king side if we cut the board exactly in half along the e-file. Uh, whereas we have one, two, three, four, five. There's an extra attacker now. And we can also see a potential of a rook coming to the h-file, which we will see in our game. King to h8, h takes g5. Now there were um, potential sacrifices on g5. For example, takes, takes, and then bishop takes g5. And the whole point is if takes, there's this f6 move, which would hurt quite a bit. For example, knight takes and then just knight takes, right? Um, this this will easily just be winning. Um, however, I decided to just play h takes, h takes, and king to f2. Because, well, how do you stop rook h1 here? Uh, this is quite annoying. They play king to g8 to get out of the rook h1 move with check. I play rook h1 anyways, because it's it's a nice move to have. Uh, they play king to f8, and then there's a really solid idea here, uh, which just wins the game. And that's rook to h7. The whole point is, even if we trade queens, and this does force, like, white, black can force a trade of queens, uh, it doesn't actually matter because of white's activity. There are way too many pieces on this side of the board, and there's another one coming in very quickly, and black's pieces are doing nothing for the defense of their king. So queen to f7 was played. Knight to h6, which is very important. Uh, bishop takes is not possible. And of course, if uh, queen takes g6, which was played, and f takes g6, there is a very important note here that they should not take on h6 because after rook takes d7, things are just falling apart. We have rook h1 coming, uh, b7 is already hanging, and this is, this is just over already. But after f takes g6, they played the move knight to c5. 
And, well, I just took it. I There's just no reason to allow that piece to be active. You didn't have to take it. I decided to because I thought it would be interesting to. Uh, and after pawn takes, uh, just knight h to f5. And what this does is it creates a mating net. Now, as you can see, this king has nearly no squares to go to anymore. And it's very close to being checkmated. For example, if I can play in two moves, uh, two moves in a row, try to find a checkmate there. Um, hopefully you can find it. I'm not going to spoil it yet, but if you want to do a little exercise in your mind of if you can idealistically uh, find a checkmate, then you should definitely look for it. Uh, my opponent here played the move a5. And after rook a to h1, which is part of that checkmating theme, they took on f5. I simply took back and they played rook a6. And of course, now the game is over because rook h8 leads to checkmate. Where after bishop takes h8, there's rook takes h8 with checkmate. So this was a cool game, sure, but there's a lot going on and it's kind of hard to cover it all in a mini lesson. But what went on here? What are the main themes of this game? I will also leave the PGN for it uh, down in the description if you're interested in looking at it a bit more in depth, as well as a few master games that I recommend checking out too, namely uh, the Karpov game I mentioned, and also Westy So got a Komsky, which has a similar theme to this game. Um, but let's look. So the main themes that we saw were that after d5 was played, uh, Black did not actively go for a, well, active plan. They needed to play something like c4. They needed to play for a potential f5, or at least have their pieces uh, go to much more active squares. And here they didn't quite get that done. Uh, as we just go through the moves quickly, uh, in the past few moves, it felt like white made more progress than black. Uh, and the issue with that is whenever you're playing in one of these slower positions where a kingside attack is possible, playing slow is not a good idea. Because if a kingside attack is possible, it probably should happen and it's probably going to just win, uh, win the game. And after specifically f5 and g5, uh, things are already quite bad because of this queen h5 and knight g4 idea, uh, where it's actually quite difficult to defend the king side now. And this is a cool maneuver that you will see uh, in that Karpov game, where they also played a, uh, a queen g6 idea, which um, their opponent just resigned after seeing. So anyways, that was my game. That was a coverage of the Roy Lopez and some of the important places to put your pieces. Namely, again, you put that knight on h3 uh, or g3 and you put the knight on f3. You usually get to put on knight on f5 if you're super lucky. You go for f4 break, sometimes f5. Uh, you usually take advantage of the light squares in this opening and you can go for a kingside attack. Anyways, I do hope you guys enjoyed this mini lecture. If you guys want to see more of these, let me know what types of openings you would like for me to cover. And thank you guys for watching. Bye-bye.